Okay, then uh, any reason we cannot proceed with sentencing today? No. All right, uh, Ms. Nordoff, are you ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. I believe the first uh, statement will be from um, John Woodworth, Alex's father, but I believe um, it will be read by a friend of his. No? By me. Okay, it will be read by me. Um, okay, just uh, again, keep in mind that when you read just read at a pace that the court reporter can sustain. At Alex's memorial service, we had over 300 people attend and we received well over 500 cards. It was touching to see how many people Alex had touched over his short life. In one of the cards, we found a letter from some man we didn't know. He told us that his son was suicidal but ran into Alex at the Racy's coffee shop where Alex worked. The two of them started talking and the boy told Alex about his intent to kill himself. Alex was able to talk him out of it and helped him find the resources to deal with his issues. The father ended the letter letting us know that his son was alive because of Alex. As much pain as we have felt over the loss to us. What is hard if not harder, is knowing that if Alex had this much impact in only a few years, how much more of an impact he could have had if he had a full life. It is this loss of potential that hurts as much as the loss of Alex himself. By killing our son, not only has Ezra robbed my wife and myself of our son, but has made the world a darker and colder place by destroying the light that Alex could have been. Okay, thank you. And that's uh, John Woodworth? Yes. Uh, the next uh, statement is from Joan Woodworth, Alex's grandmother, that she would like uh, to have read as well. Ezra McCandless lured my grandson to a remote location with the express intent of murdering him. Alex was our oldest grandson, who we spent every minute with growing up and continues a very close relationship with through college. We took the time once a month to drive the hour and a half to see him, take him out to lunch, shopping, and just spend time with him from the time he started college in Eau Claire. We often picked him up or drove him back after weekend or holiday visits. These were some of our most cherished times with him. Her selfish act has robbed our entire family of any possibilities of seeing him reach his dream of becoming a professor, of spending another birthday, weekend, lunch, or holiday with him, ever see him get married or have children of his own. These were all robbed from us. His loss has been the worst nightmare of our lives. We have suffered great mental anguish, unbearable grief, and loss. We have not been able to have a joyful holiday in two years. Robbed each year from joy and only knowing sorrow of the one who will never be with us again. This has also greatly affected his parents and younger siblings. Due to a hearing we attended, my husband Marv had a heart attack and spent 20 days between three hospitals last December. The health toll on us can't be measured. Knowing that she intentionally killed him for selfish reasons, stabbed him 16 times, watching the blood and life drain from his body, is a picture that I live with every day. Watching her reactions at the hearing and trial, knowing that she didn't even show an ounce of concern, remorse, or sadness for his loss, was something I believe shows her true character. As a Christian, I know that God has forgiven me much in my life, so I must also forgive her. However, I do know that God expects accountability for our sins and actions. I then feel it is only right that she does suffer the consequences of this brutal, selfish murder by spending many, many years in prison and get mental help. I feel if given the opportunity, she definitely will kill again 
And my prayer is that she will never be able to harm another person like she did Alex or put another family through what we have been through. Thank you. And I believe the next will be um, Scott or Amy Clark, the uncle and aunt to, to Alex. You can come right up here and uh, right to the witness stand. All right, because it is sentencing, I, I don't think it's necessary to uh, place a person under oath. I just okay. uh, thought that would be a good location to make a statement from. You, you, you may be seated if you wish. You can stand if you'd like as well. I <clears> think. <throat> You took a life. You took away a son, a brother, a grandson, a nephew, a cousin, and a friend. Alex was loved by so many. He did not have one ounce of meanness or anger in him. He indeed was about giving and helping. He was funny. He was kind and respectful. He had such an intelligent and witty mind. He was such a kind and loving man that despite him knowing how unstable you were, he was still willing to give you compassion. He left with you that fateful day believing he was going to help you in some way. And instead you took his life. He definitely is not the monster you attempted to portray him as. Seeing and hearing how you brutally took his life will forever be etched in our minds. Although we try to replace that with fond memories of Alex. There will be a lifetime of emptiness for our family and especially for Alex's parents, Kim and John, and his younger siblings who looked up to him. What more heartbreaking than the loss of your child? Your world is turned upside down and a piece of your heart will be missing forever. Alex touched so many people's lives in the 24 years he was with us, and now we have been robbed of seeing what his potential could have been. He had great potential of touching many more people's lives. As we would hear it argued in court by this defense team, that Alex could have been up walking and talking for up to 30 minutes with his injuries. We heard that as Alex could And what more awful to imagine is your child or family member suffering for any period of time. You caused pain and suffering to Alex, and you have caused pain and suffering to our family. You were never the victim, and there will be no forgiveness from us, from us for what you have done. This is our last chance to advocate for Alex and the precious life that you took. We know this won't bring him back, having seen how Alex's life was brutally taken by you. We want the harshest sentence of life in prison. Going through this process, it has felt as though we have had to go through losing him again. You took a life, and we can only hope that the rest of your life is misery as the rest of our life will be misery, missing Alex and wondering where Alex's life would have taken him. Okay, and uh, you know, when you start, can we just get a spelling of your name? Uh -huh. sure. Krista is spelled? K-R-I-S-T-A, last name Hall, H-A-L-L. -L. Thank you. Sister to Kim Woodworth and Alex's favorite aunt. 
That's been an ongoing joke amongst the aunts with all of our nieces and nephews from the time they were little enough to bribe with candy. There's a quote that I read not long after Alex's death, and although I don't recall the author, I wanted to share it today because of its simplicity, which rings true in regards to grieving. Mourning is one of the deepest expressions of pure love. As we continue to mourn for Alex, and will continue to honor his life by sharing the memories he left us with over the years. We've all mourned for a loved one in our lives and experienced the heartaching depth of despair that that creates. Even if you didn't know Alex, human nature is to be respectful of the family and show some empathy or compassion. Going into the trial, we weren't sure what to expect, but I knew although it might be awkward, I certainly wouldn't have any hard feelings against Ezra's family. And I thought surely they might feel the same about us, right? There were no words, no idea what to expect. When my sister Kim said good morning to one of the family's members of Ezra, as we entered the courtroom one of the first mornings, there was no reply. No eye contact, nothing. I was appalled and angry. My sister lost her son. For those of you that didn't know Alex, to put it simply, he was incredibly smart and witty. We all looked forward to seeing him during the holidays, noticing the changes that take place from a high school graduate who goes off to college, watching him develop into the young man that he was, finding his place in the world, pursuing his interests, Conversation with Alex was never boring or dull. Until this trial, I don't think any of us really understood what an incredible writer he had already become. The brief excerpts that we heard in court were only a fraction of what he was trying to say, and yet it was plain to see that his gift for philosophical studies and theories was apparent. He was a thinker analyzing, studying, and questioning every aspect of life and love, and submersing himself into philosophical theories of other writers. Anything that gave him inspiration to write, he would have been an incredible philosophical professor, and he had the ambition to pursue his education and earn a doctorate. There's so much to life that he had yet to experience, a lifetime of wonder, exploration, love, friendships and memories, and you, Ezra, took that away from him. Selfishly. Sadly, he'll never experience what it means to truly love and be loved by another. But perhaps if there's any comfort in knowing, even if for a brief period of time, he thought he was in love and happy with you. It's been one year, 10 months, and 16 days. And Ezra, while we continue to mourn Alex's passing, it's hard not to notice that throughout the trial, we never saw any sign of sadness, shame, compassion, or the slightest bit of remorse in what you had done. You're so caught up in your own lies and behavior, consistently taking advantage of those around you, you took somebody's life. It was never a situation of self-defense. Maybe for Alex as he struggled trying to save his own and get away, but never for you. In the years to come, you're gonna have ample time to yourself. Rather than continuously thinking about how you've been wronged or what society owes you, I ask that you start reflecting upon your actions. Stop thinking about yourself as the victim. As we've learned throughout the trial, it seems to be an ongoing excuse for all of your poor decisions, lack of accountability, and actions in life. Everyone you see in this courtroom today has suffered some type of traumatic event or been victimized in some way. Life is hard. If you are lucky enough to experience freedom again someday, do something good. Get a job, be responsible, take ownership of your life and contribute to society in a positive way. And if you're lucky enough to find someone who will look past your faults and accept you for what you've done and the person that you are, just as Alex had done, treat them well, love unconditionally, and expect nothing in return.
the unviolent wounds that you inflicted on his body, the pictures of which were horrific. Thus we forget the unseen emotional wounds that you've created as well. You disregarded his friendship and compassion. He was there for you when you needed a friend, when you needed a place to stay, when you needed comfort and a soft place to fall. He was there for you. You knew he accepted your past and accepted us as you were when you were together. Remember the quote, come as you are, flaws and all. You made him believe that you actually loved and cared for him because it was convenient for you at the time. When that was no longer the case and he was more of an obstacle in your grandiose scheme and plan, you discarded his feelings and ultimately his life. Your actions have pierced the heart and soul of those who loved him. Our family, our community filled with neighbors, former teachers, Classmates, coworkers, and so many friends he's made over the years. Those wounds will never heal. Ezra, you cannot fathom and will likely never know the love that a mother has for her child. For that itself is truly a blessing. And I hope you never have the opportunity to experience it because I don't think you're capable of truly loving another person and nurturing another human. My sister Kim has not only lost a child, team create a fictional story of what happened painting Alex as a demonic person it's incomprehensible I can only imagine the agonizing heartache that tears through her every day and night as a mother myself I can't pretend to understand but my heart aches and my tears flow not only for Alex but for my sister Her smile and her kind, gentle demeanor is heartache and agony. She's stronger than anyone I've ever known, putting everyone else's needs before hers. Her faith runs deep. She exudes patience, love, and acceptance to everyone she meets, just as Alex did for you. My name is Dale Hall. I am an uncle-in-law to Alexander Woodworth. Um, I, pile, I want to apologize up front, as I've been a part of the system in law enforcement for 25 years. Um, I, I don't want to remember dates, uh, bad things that have happened, um, because the dates are what come back to haunt us in law enforcement. Um, so I'll give estimates on dates in my statement. In late March of 2018, I was asked by my family to see if I could see if I could get information because Alex was missing. Um, when I got a hold of the investigator that day, I was advised that Alex wasn't missing um, and that Alex was at the medical examiner's office. Uh, being in law enforcement for as long as I was, I knew why he was at a law or a medical examiner's office because I knew he was dead. I then offered to do death notification for the family because this family, the family that Alex was part of, the family that I had been part of for 22 plus years at that time, family is their top priority. I then went and spoke with Kim, Alex's mom. At that time I destroyed her by giving her the worst information that a mother could get. I then called John as he's away on business. And then I destroyed him by giving him the worst information that a father could get. After speaking with John, I then went to my mother and father-in-law's house, Alex's grandma and grandpa, and I destroyed their lives as well. 
giving them the most worst, the, giving them the worst information that anybody could have. I had given a lot of death notifications in my 25 year career. And I will say that this has been the most difficult because this destroyed me as well. Over the next several months I sat idle, which also destroyed me. But that hurt was nothing compared to the pain of the family not being able to lay Alex to rest. As this system, the system that I've been a part of for so many years, jockeyed with Alex's body, labeling him as evidence. Keeping him from his family was beyond any part of reasonable, objectively reasonable, or even humane. Around four months after Alex was murdered, we finally got to lay him to rest. Just two months after Alex was found murdered, there was a request that he, or the defense, be allowed 60 more days to hold on to his body so they could work and do their work with the information given by the state. That's my request for the honor. 60 years. One year for every day that Alex was withheld from us, laying there, and with us not being able to touch him. As I looked at the photographs of the injuries that you had suffered, Ezra, I agree that like is like. And what I mean by that is, the marks that you admitted to doing yourself were exactly like the marks that you accused Alex of doing. If you believe that, like is like, like the jury must have, then you can honestly say that the knife was never in Alex's hand. Now that I believe that the, Alex was, that the knife was never in Alex's hand, why do I believe that? Because of character. We all know people and people's character. I can tell you and tell everybody in this courtroom that Alexander Woodworth never raised a knife to you to hurt you in any way. There was no self-defense. He just didn't have, his, have it in his character to hurt anyone. <clears throat> so, if the knife was never in his hand, then Ezra attacked and destroyed one of the most caring people in this world. She took away one of the most beautiful minds that I've ever known. People lose friends, family, cousins, uncles every day, but to lose a child should never happen. To bury our baby, Kim's baby, is not the way that life goes. We watched for 15 days in this trial where Elvis' family was able to speak, hug, and touch her, and we had to sit watch, knowing that we'd never get to touch Alex again until we are not bound to this earth. Watching that was very painful. I ask they give the victims us the same benefit. And we'll never have to sit and watch Edra laugh, laugh, touch, hold her family again until we are unbound by this earth and get to be with Alex. I hope that she stays in prison for as long as we all live, the friends, the cousins, mother and dad. I have always preached that the system has two prongs. First prong, to rehabilitate, to give offenders the tools that to be productive members of society. Second prong, to protect society from offenders that can't be rehabilitated. Ezra shows no remorse for what she has done. There is no AA group or prison program that would be able to give her any caring for human life. I ask the judge to please protect society. Protect future victims from suffering the way that Alexander Woodworth did on that cold March day, where he was driven to an isolated area, attacked and murdered, alone and afraid. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, I've been provided um, with a written statement this morning from Samantha Cobbs that she would like uh, read. Uh, her last name is spelled K-O-B-S. Honorable Judge James Peterson, my name is Samantha Cobbs. 
I write to you in an attempt to summarize the impact that the loss of my dear friend Alex has had on me and others over the past 23 months. How does one begin to explain what it feels like to lose somebody so suddenly and so sense senselessly? I can only hope that this letter sheds an ounce of light on the turmoil that I have had in my heart. To my knowledge, I was one of the first, if not the first, friend to find out that Alex had been killed. I did not find out until I picked up my phone and called his parents on Sunday morning, March 25th. I was calling to tell them that his friends were about to hang up missing per person posters and that we were sending our love and support. You can imagine my shock and horror as his father stayed silent on the other line, then interrupted me to tell me that Alex was already found, dead and deserted. I will never forget the words that he used or the pain in his trembling voice. To say that I felt stupid would be an understatement. Not only because I felt I was invading their privacy as they mourned, but because up until that moment, I had been ignorantly optimistic. I consider myself a very strong person, but March and April of 2018, I was not strong. I slept with my lights on for weeks. Bedroom lights, kitchen lights. I would even prop a chair against my bedroom door before I fell asleep. I was afraid to start my car in the mornings before work. I was afraid to be alone in my own home. If my roommate was gone for a night or weekend, I would stay with friends to feel less anxious. Perhaps it was because I knew the defendant knew where I lived, and I didn't know whether they would meet bail. I may have been thinking a bit irrationally, but this was my reality for a very long time. And to be quite frank, nothing in this case seemed rational. I moved out of my apartment at the end of May 2018, which was about when Alex should have been moving in. I couldn't bring myself to stay there, to try to find somebody to take over his part of the lease. It felt wrong, and I felt unsafe. Imagine how anxious I felt having to call my landlord and explain that the kind young man she'd met just a few weeks prior was now a homicide victim. Imagine how I felt when I asked to break my lease, to move out of a beautiful apartment that I loved because I didn't have the emotional strength or energy to try to find somebody else to replace him. I spoke at Alex's funeral his initial funeral, where his family was unable to bury him because of ongoing autopsies. The church was packed, and so many people had stories to share. I was there when his bedroom was cleaned out and his belongings were being removed from his favorite city, a city he truly belonged to. I was there when his remains were finally buried just outside his hometown many months after he was killed. I watched his mother scream in agony as she collapsed over his urn on that beautiful summer day. Last fall, I was there in the courtroom to testify in front of the jury and the cameras. My face was plastered all over the internet in local news stations. I was attacked in the comments of social media posts. In promotional videos from Court TV, my face was the first face shown, second only to that of the defendant. Imagine how uncomfortable every time one of my students walked up to me and said, hey, Ms. Cobbs, I saw you on TV last night. Or even worse, when complete strangers said the same exact thing. Alex's murder has impacted me beyond measure, and I am only one of the many friends and family members to have experienced these traumas since March 2018. Alex was such a beautiful soul. Again and again, stories have been told of his intellect, compassion, and curiosity. If he were still here, I have no doubt he would be working towards receiving his PhD in philosophy as a McNair scholar. And knowing Alex, probably getting an additional PhD in something completely different just because he could. He was the smartest and most humble person I knew, 
and I continue to, fe continue to feel his absence as my life moves away from these difficult times. I was there in the courtroom as the jury announced that it had found the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of first degree intentional homicide that day late in October. For many of Alex's family members and friends, we simply desire a sense of closure. We trust in our judicial system to appropriately penalize those who are found guilty of crimes. And we trust that the sentences for such crimes are fair and just. I ask that you consider the inconsistencies of the defendant's stories, the lack of remorse, and the continued denial of wrongdoing, in addition to the unanimous guilty verdict when deciding on the sentence for the defendant, Ezra J. McCandless. Sincerely, Samantha Cobbs. Um, I believe the next statement will be uh, from Allison Kexel. What's the last name? Uh, Kexel, K-E-X-E-L. Okay. All right, thank you. I thought I looked forward to this because I've been angry and I thought that I would know what to say to you today but the truth is I don't I don't think there's any string of words that can express how deeply you've hurt all of us there's no statement powerful enough to move you you've shown no shame no guilt or remorse for the crime that you've committed. You severed a single thread in my life and I watched so many others completely unfold. The morning I found out that you... Judge, I, I don't want to be rude to Ms. Castle or anybody, but... Everybody else got to read their statements? I... Hold on, just hold on a second. I think that... It would be a perp I, I, I'm not saying that she shouldn't read her statement. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that. I did just ask that she address the court. Because okay. I think this the is court personal. Is, well, I, I, I think it's appropriate for you to address the court. You can, you know, you can state what it is you want to say. But um, I think we uh, just address the court. I think that we'll just leave it at that. The morning we found out Alex was dead. I knew it was the defendant. I don't know how, I just knew. I sat in a living room full of our old friends, my friends, and cried. For months we held one another, sobbing, struggling, trying to understand the sweetest man that we all loved. He was soft and gentle he never once made me feel bad. He was receptive to my feelings, understanding, kind, compassionate. And I'm not only heartbroken, but I'm full of rage. I'm sad that so many times Alex told me about his siblings who he loved so much and to see them at his funeral. <laughs> Something that I can't grasp. Being the youngest of my family, my brothers pretty much raised me, and I, that is a pain that I... <laughs> just can't fathom. Alex will never get to go to grad school. He's never going to be a professor to share his passions and his ideas with like-minded individuals. He'll never be loved to live a full life. He'll never grow old because you took that away from him. You took away from so many of us someone that we loved. And as your friend, the friend of the defendant, you will never get to experience a full life either. You are so talented, and I would have loved to see you flourish and to create great art 
but selling it for an appeal will be your highlight as an artist. I'm angry. I've spent so many days trying to get by, so many nights screaming and sobbing, and being held in return by our old friends, and watching them break over and over. You will never know the extent of the irreparable damage you've caused. Not only to all of those that I love, and to Alex's family, and to all of those that Alex knew, but to sexual assault victims as well. Your numerous and ongoing lies have and continue to discredit those who have suffered, and as a woman and a victim myself, I am disappointed. I don't believe in locking people up like animals or fighting violence with violence. I think prison is just slavery disguised. However, your crime was so heinous, so shameful, and so disgusting that I do believe you should serve a life sentence without parole. I hope in time that you grow enough to at least admit for the first time to tell the truth just what you've done to all of us in this room and outside of this room and as a community. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to read an impact statement by Sarah Lowe, L-O-W-E. I know this is cliche, but this is what immediately came to mind when I started reflecting on what to say today. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because Alex was genuinely a good person. Good people are people who help unconditionally, respect unconditionally, and love unconditionally. Alex was a good person. Here are some ways that Alex demonstrated these qualities in my life. One way that Alex helped me unconditionally when I, was when I was studying for the GRE. He took the time to come help me almost every day of the week for multiple weeks. I wasn't even paying him. That's a lot to do for someone. Alex didn't think it was that big of a thing to do. Also, Alex showed unconditional respect for me, for my brain, for my dreams, for my beliefs, for my potential, and for myself. When I first met him, we went on a few dates and started seeing each other. When we had our first kiss, he first asked if it was okay to kiss me. Who does that these days? Eventually, I decided that I wasn't in a place to date right then and asked if we could be friends. He was fine with that, and we even ended up being housemates. When I got the results of my GRE test, I hadn't done well. I felt ashamed and felt like a failure. Alex was the first person I thought of because his love was unconditional. I knew he wouldn't judge me. He just held me while I cried and told me that he loved me, which meant a lot. We had multiple conversations about what we believed. With my background in psychology, I believe that people need to love themselves first before they can really love other people. Alex had a different way of thinking, which might not always have been the healthiest for him, but it's what he believed. He said, quote, as long as I make other people happy, that makes me happiest. As long as I share with other people, that's what makes me content. This philosophy was one that he believed, but also followed, as he often knew I was having a tough day and as a result would give me hugs and say I love you. When you lose someone like Alex, when the world loses someone like Alex, it makes a huge difference. This is how losing Alex impacts me. I've had depression, sudden bouts of crying, insomnia, and recurring nightmares. It's affected my work, my relationships, and my overall quality for, of life. Losing Alex also has effects for the future. That's in the what ifs, in the absence of a future. For example, all the times that I can't call him, can't talk to him, Oftentimes, he's the one person that I want to talk to, and it's hard to know I can't, to know that I'll never talk to him again. Then there's the impact that he would have had on other people. Alex planned to be a philosophy professor. He had a great influence on my life through our academic discussions, and that's an impact that he will never 
that he will never have on me going forward, nor on all of the students and colleagues he could have benefited from having him in their lives. Alex was a good person, and he made me a better person. This is the impact that Alex's death has had on me, and I miss him every day. Alex was a forgiving person. I believe that he would want you to be lenient in sentencing, because that's who he was. I, too, am usually for giving people a second chance. But when a person makes the decision to stab someone 16 times and leave them suffering to die, I don't think they deserve a second chance. For this reason, I recommend that Ezra receive the maximum penalty. Thank you. The next statement will be from Court Fox. I remember when I first met Alex, it was in class. He was just this young kid that was brilliant, shocked everyone in the class with his insights, his ability to speak, his ability to understand the concepts. But I didn't know him, I didn't even know his name. And I had another friend who was also in philosophy, but we didn't share the same courses. And this other friend and I would get together and we would talk about, he also had this young kid that was just so freaking impressive and a short while later we figured out that we were talking about the same incredibly impressive kid. And so we're like, we have to know this guy. So we finagled our way into a reading group with him that he was setting up on his own just to do more philosophy outside of class. Uh, unfortunately for him, but fortunately for Nick and I, we were the only ones that showed up. <laughs> But for, I think, all of two sessions, we actually did do the reading and do the discussion. But just those short moments with him inside of a coffee cafe, I knew I wanted to be this man's friend. Because <laughs> his kindness, his empathy, his humor, his ungodly intellect just radiated out from him. And becoming his friend was the easiest thing because he so loved people. He just, as people have spoken, his joy came from other people. His most enjoyable moments in life were just interacting with people, and when you did, his face lit up and all of that incredible intellect and mind was trained right on you. He was so engaged and interested, it could almost be daunting to have such an intellect fully focused on you, but it was out of genuine kindness and interest. And to say that he was my best friend is almost limiting what he was to me. It probably speaks poorly of me, but after his death I have cast about my friends and found them all wanting. No one has been able to understand me, show the amount of concern, not to say that my other friends and family don't, but he was unique in his ability to just show it and to put in the work, and it wasn't work for him. <laughs> And that he would have gone on to great things in philosophy and education is undeniable. To He did uh, organize and uh, contribute to a lot of extracurricular reading groups and other study groups. And his ability to speak to people, to use his brilliant mind, but still tone it down to explain, he would have been one of the 
best professors, but when he was in his element, speaking for himself, articulating his own thoughts, he was brilliant. And that's gone. But I don't want to naysay the other peoples up that have been up here, but I am absolutely certain that Alex would have asked for some sort of leniency because he did fully believe that every human being is possessed with infinite potential and to squander that potential is perhaps the greatest sin. But I'm not as kind of man as Alex was, but I still have to agree with him. I would like to see Ezra released from prison at some point in her life, I care not when, not for a chance of forgiveness or to, you know, find some sort of salvation, but because after decades in prison she will find inevitably some sort of normalcy, some sort of stability. It will become her life and she will, if not be happy with it, be acquainted with it. I would like to ruin that for her again and cast her out into the wider world. I would like to see her struggle for friends, employment, <coughs> housing, knowing that the pall of her actions lay <coughs> over her. I want her to agonize with each new person that she meets. Is she upfront about what she's done or does she hide it and have to live with the anxiety of, oh my god, what if they find out? I want more chaos in her life after she's found normalcy. Consequent actions have consequences and to simply lock her away for the rest of her life will bar her from the full complement of consequences that she could suffer for this. And I would like to see that. I don't care when, but personally, that is what I would like. So, thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, the uh, next statement, uh, which I will be reading, is from Sarah Woodworth, uh, the sister of Alex. Your Honor, and all those present, hello. You haven't seen my face during the trial, but I have watched it closely. I'm Alex Woodworth's little sister, but this year, I will be older than he was. Something I told him I would do as a little girl, but not something I ever wanted to experience when I realized how that was possible. I'll be 24 this coming May, and he should have been 26. Maybe finishing his doctorate, seeing me as I talk about our futures. Maybe I would have had the guts to tell him I love him, even if we fell away the last two years of his life. But I'll never know if I would, because he's gone. He's gone, and I'll never get to tell him I love him ever again. I've put off writing this letter because it feels like a goodbye. I don't want a goodbye. But I know if I don't do this, I'll regret it for the rest of the life I'll spend without him. I could never tell him how I felt, because he thought it would be stupid. Instead, he'd want to talk about me going back to school and ask me about my opinions on humanity. And I'd know, in between the lines of philosophy, he was telling me he loved me. And I'd do my best to tell him I love you too. Because we were best friends growing up, being only two years apart. We started our life together with me being born. And as I lay fresh and still gross on our mother's chest, he managed to get his big toddler head stuck in a rocking chair. I'm often told 
how I would listen to him for hours as a baby. He'd tuck me into my crib and lay next to me while I fell asleep, kissing my head gently. And when I was in a walker, he'd slowly pat my head while watching TV whenever I stopped by him. He'd tell me stories, and when I was old enough to understand, I took them as gospel. There was, in fact, a volcano under our large black recliner. I cried for hours, scared it had erupt. He'd tell me about the fish in the ocean. I'd ask, is that really true? And he'd simply say yes. And that was that. When we were a bit older and going to school, I cut my hair short so I could join the boys club and play with him more in our neighborhood. He taught me how to build forts and do kicks and punches and we'd race across mud puddles together and get in trouble together. And it was the best child I could have. When I learned I didn't know how to read or do math well, he spent hours helping me, printing off worksheets during the summer, playing me his favorite songs, replaying the ones I liked, and grading my papers so I could catch up with my class. I never got better at math, but thanks to him I got the highest score on the English portion of the ACT. He was so proud. I hope he remembered it was all because of him. He went to college, and so did I, and we didn't talk much. I got married, he got a degree. And after a year, we realized we hadn't seen each other. That Easter of 2018, I was supposed to go home to catch up. My mom told me he was looking forward to it. But that Easter was an empty seat and an empty grave the day before. I've been dreaming about him since. And whenever I wake up, it feels like the grief is new. Because for a second he's alive. And like a cruel joke, he's taken away from us again. I woke up to my mom's shattered voice that Saturday. They found Alex. He's dead. I couldn't move. It was a scene from a sad movie. It wasn't real. I said, okay, and hung up. And immediately felt my body heave as the reality sank in. I was married then. I got a divorce soon after. I felt like my life crumbled apart. And I was doing everything I could to make a new one that he couldn't have. The constant pressure of needing to have a life he'd want on my shoulders. To this day, it's hard to know if what I'm doing is what I want or if it's me trying to live out his dream. I don't know what to write besides that. I know my words won't make the one who took him regret it. And I don't think that's what I want. I think what I want, more than anything, is for everyone who doubts this verdict to know that he'd never hurt a fly. I have complex PTSD from sexual abuse 
and abuse from previous romantic partners. partners. And though I can understand how a flashback feels, I couldn't imagine using it in court. If I hurt my current partner because of my disorder, I'd want to be put away for life. If I took him away from his siblings and families, I'd have deserved time. Because regardless of my hatred and fear for my abusers, they have loved ones. They have people who would feel this anguish, even if they knew they were bad. No one should feel this way. A mother shouldn't outlive her son. And a younger sibling should never avoid the calendar thinking about the birthdays that will come that should be celebrated differently. And through it all, I should have never felt this unwavering weight of feeling like it should have been me. If I could, I would choose me every time. Why would anyone be okay with knowing that's what we all have to live with the rest of our lives? Why do we have to live with the image of hundreds of people we didn't know drive hours to his funeral? Why do I have to live looking through his Facebook page just to feel close to him again. I want to leave you with this because I feel it sums up everything while helping me end this without rambling. The night before I wrote this, I had a dream about him again. But in this dream, I was supposed to go somewhere. I had an appointment. It was important, but he showed up right before I left. And he said he only had that day to see me. In the dream, I told him, sorry, I have to see someone. I have to go. His eyes watered and he looked away, trying not to cry. I don't think I ever remember seeing him cry. I understand, but this is the last time we'll ever be able to talk. And I knew he was right. If I left, it'd be goodbye for good. So I said I'd stay. And we looked at each other with peace. He let a few tears escape, smiled, and then I woke up. And this time, I knew he was gone. That lingering feeling of him wasn't there. And I can't help but cry writing this knowing we'll never have that in real life. I won't be able to say, I'll stay a while so we can catch up. Because Alex Woodworth was slaughtered. And the only time I'll ever be able to see him ever again is in my dreams. And when I wake, I'll be able to think as it should have been me. Thank you for your time. I hope this made more sense than his death. And I hope no one here has to experience my words in their own life. And to his murder, and to his murderer, you've not seen me, but I have seen you. And with even all my grief and rage, I mean it when I say, I want no one to feel how I do, not even you. 
and that should speak more loudly than anything else I've said about how deeply this pain goes. Sarah Woodworth. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for this time. I'm going to start by changing just a bit on especially the PSI because the time has passed since I said, you know, the least amount. And every day I wake up without Alex is a day that I, I, I start every day talking to him. I end every day talking to him. And uh, since that time, I realize that he'll never come back. The hurt is always there, but I thought it'd get better, and maybe it will. So I'll just read my letter now. Today is not Ezra's day. Three months ago, she had her day, in fact, three weeks. She was convicted of first degree intentional murder. She killed my grandson, and at this point we, I, don't understand why, only how. Not even the timeline of the event itself. When was Alex tortured before he died? It is certainly possible as three hours of unexplained time is given. Maybe it's less, but it's a bunch of time. We do not know the fear and the pain, the terror that he felt as he was dying. And looking at those pictures, I can only imagine at times, and that picture, they come back so readily. How he got himself from the ground to the back seat of the car, we certainly don't know the pain he felt as he was being stabbed or his blood was being poured out of his body. We just know that he was alive at noon and gone at four. I do not believe she deserves mercy from the court due to her age or sex as Alex died a terrible death. Look at the pictures, blood up and down the front and the back of his jeans yet not in the car, stabbed in the stomach and the groin. I call that torture. This I do know. We'll never see Alex again, never see his smile, never hear his weird humor, or see the hope that he had and shared with so many others. We will never know where life is leading him. He's gone, and so is a good part of our lives as well. A hole that can never be filled, an action taken by her without reason or remorse. There's not enough years left any place to replace or to pay the price of Alice's death. And thank you. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, that um, concludes the state's uh, victim impact statements. Um, I would just ask that if the defense has any character witnesses, that they would go first before the attorneys make their arguments. All right. Any objection to proceeding that way, Ms. Bushney? Uh, Judge, we're going to have our witnesses speak when it's our turn for the sentencing okay. presentation not before the state. The state's not entitled to listen to them in advance. Um, I'd like to proceed the way every other sentencing in my 39 years as a lawyer has gone. All right. Then Ms. But Cole, I will have them speak before I make my remarks. All right. Well, then that is, I guess, normal, normally the way we do things, that you present your witnesses and make your arguments, and then defense has their opportunity. So why don't you go ahead then with your arguments, recommendations. Okay. Your Honor, as a prosecutor, you don't get to choose the facts of your case. You don't get to choose your victim. And in a homicide case, the defense is frequently blame the victim. And that was no exception in this case. And as the 
victim impact statements reveal Alex wasn't your typical 24-year-old student. In preparation for trial, we met with friend after friend from the Racy's crowd. And all of them described Alex in a similar way. Kind, considerate, intelligent, and always striving to learn more and understand different schools of thought. A friend who would happily put down his own writings and spend hours to help another friend learn their homework. A friend who would drink cups and cups of coffee to listen to someone who needed to talk. We ended each one of our witness preparation meetings with one question. Was Alex the type of person who was more concerned with himself or more concerned with others? And every single response was a resounding, more concerned with others. Without a doubt, Alex was only 24 years old and was going places. He was pursuing his dreams to become a professor. Some of his writings were getting published. And no doubt, he was going to make this world a better place. Pursuant to the Wisconsin Supreme Court decision in Galleon, the courts to identify and rank its objectives in sentencing. In this case, the state ranks the sentencing objectives in the following order. First and most importantly, protection of the public. Second, punishment. Third, deterrence to others. And fourth, rehabilitation of the defendant. These rankings derive from the facts of this case because the defendant engaged in a brutal and heinous attack on a young man and then left him there to die. When the court considers the seriousness of the offense, there is nothing more serious than the loss of an innocent life. In fact, the court is required to impose a life sentence for the defendant. The only issue is whether the defendant should be given the opportunity for parole. And given the very violent and heinous nature of Alex's murder, the state strongly argues that such an opportunity would be wholly inappropriate in this case. When the court considers the seriousness of the offense, it needs to remember that the defendant deliberately took a knife from her father's home and lured Alex to a remote location to brutally murder him. She violently and brutally stabbed him through the scalp threw the bone into the brain, sliced his neck three times, pierced his lungs, stabbed him in the genitals. She stabbed him not once, not twice, but 16 times. The remote location she lured him to, Alex's screams and cries would be heard by no one. And there's no indication that Alex ever even fought back. These were 16 deliberate and separate choices to stab and kill Alex. And so clearly this murder was extremely violent and brutal. When the court considers the character of the defendant, it needs to consider the defendant's actions after she murdered Alex. She staged the crime scene. She didn't run for help. She didn't call for help. She didn't try to stop the bleeding as Alex lay motionless. What did she do? She cut herself, planted blood around the crime scene where Alex lay dead or dying. She then had the apparent presence of mind to carve boy into her arm. She found Alex's phone. She didn't call for help. She didn't give Alex's phone to Don Sipple. No, she broke the phone, removed the battery, threw it in the ditch so no one could find Alex. <coughs> She continued her performance and her calculated plan to try to be the victim, to throw law enforcement off of what really happened. <coughs> she never mentioned Alex, lay lifeless down that road. Nope, she asked for Jason Mingle. She tried to manipulate every person she came in contact with after March 22nd, 2018 with her Victim Act. Throughout the trial, the defense tried in vain to utilize smoke and mirrors to hide the actions of the defendant. And the defendant's sentencing memorandum is round two, round two of that attempt to try to distract from the heinous and brutal actions of their client.
the defense tries to humanize the defendant by filing photographs of the defendant playing with her siblings and eating pizza. And to the extent the court wishes to rely on those photographs in its sentencing decision, I'd ask the court to remember the photographs up on that screen of Alex laying dead out the back of a car. The photographs of Alex at this autopsy. which depict the violent nature at which Alex lost his life at the hands of the defendant. The defendant's sentencing memorandum is yet another example of a defendant who refuses to accept responsibility and is attempting to retry this case, even though the jury has already found her guilty. <clears throat> Shortly before coming into sentencing, we located a GoFundMe page that I would like to provide the court the defense has been provided with the same. It, it was a GoFundMe page. It's a defunct GoFundMe page, just so its record is clear. It's a what? I'm sorry? It's defunct. It's defunct. It may show up on the internet as a GoFundMe page, however, it's defunct. It is not an active GoFundMe page. Well, I certainly believe it's relevant <coughs> as it provides the defendant's version of events or another version of events um, given she did not provide a separate statement to the PSI writer. However, in her GoFundMe page, which is entitled Support an Artist, Ms. Um, McCandless has been in the jail and she doesn't have access to the internet. So somebody else wrote this. And therefore, I would ask that the court not consider it and the state be barred from reading it into the record. Because Ms. McCandless, um, although this appears to be written the first person, we know, objectively speaking, she doesn't have any access to the internet and can't do this. Well, it says right on the front of it that it was uh Rosie Gunnelson is organizing this fundraiser. So, um, yes, Your Honor, but it's then signed Ezra McCandless. It doesn't matter. She, it's physically impossible for her to have written this and posted it online. So I don't think it should be considered when looking at Ms. McCandless's character or the galleon factors. All right. Well, I, I think the court is capable of sorting things out. So um, I don't know. What is it that you plan to do with this? Uh, well, Your Honor, I just think it's a relevant is it's another version of the defendant's story and her continued refusal to, to take responsibility for her actions. Um, so I think it's relevant when the court considers the character of the defendant um, where she continues to paint herself as a victim in this uh, GoFundMe page. All right. Well, I'm going to allow you to go ahead, Ms. Nodoff. Uh, I'll note the state's objection. Uh, the defense objection. I mean, the defense objection, yes. Okay. That's noted and preserved for the record. Thank you. Thank you. In this GoFundMe page, it's written, in the end, this case was not decided on facts, logic, or the law. It was decided on retribution, shock, emotion, and prejudice. She continues to paint herself as a victim as that her sexuality, gender, and intelligence was attacked. She, it's written, 15 days attacked, re-traumatized, re-experiencing traumatic details. How dare you be a young woman with more than one sexual partner? How dare you be LGBTQ? How dare you have a choice when it comes to your body? She continues to write, I did not have to raise my hand to speak. I made a choice to speak, to tell the truth of what has happened to me. I have survived. And now she's facing a mandatory life sentence and basically support her for her appeal. Again, painting herself as the victim. Again, refusing to accept responsibility for what she did. The defendant sentencing, um, as we noted in our sentencing memorandum, the defendant described herself better than I ever could when she wrote her paper about Ted Bundy. The defense notes she wrote this when she was 16, but yet she shared this with Jason Mingle 
and highlighted certain portions less than two weeks before Alex's death. And even in text messages to Alex, she talks about her fascination with psychopaths. She writes, during an interview, Theodore Robert Bundy, also known as Ted Bundy, said, quote, I don't feel guilty for anything. I feel sorry for people who feel guilt. Ted Bundy was considered an animal. Excuse me, Judge. At this point, honestly, reading of a high school academic paper about Ted Bundy and saying that that's Ezra McCandless's character because she was proud of and shared her writing. I wasn't going to interrupt the state, but I actually find this so outrageous at sentencing that I feel compelled to object. And I've never objected at a sentencing hearing in my life. Um, but to, um, you know, the, the state chose to file this with the court. I don't know if this is some kind of playing to television cameras um, or what's going on here exactly, but I think it's an outrage to talk about Ezra McCandless like she's Ted Bundy. She's guilty of a first degree intentional homicide. The court's going to sentence her on that. But um, I, this is an attempt, a blatant attempt to elicit some kind of prejudice that's just beyond the pale here. So I would like my objection noted. All right. Well, <clears throat> it was submitted with the state sentencing uh, memorandum. Um, you know, uh, so I'm aware of it. And uh, I'll note your objection. Be preserved for the record. Court understands what it should consider and can consider its sentencing. And rules of evidence do not apply. And uh, but this is the state's their sentencing presentation. So uh, note your objection, but Ms. Nordoff, you may continue. In her paper about Ted Bundy, she writes, Ted Bundy was considered an animal, knew it, and felt no remorse about it. The defendant numerous times in her writings on Instagram, in her art, in her letters from the jail, refers to herself as the fox, the tricky one. I'd also ask the court to remember one of the pretrial filings of the defendant's self-reflecting journal, where in that journal she's depicting herself in overalls with a fox face, where she told her friend Brianna Larson as she was drawing this journal that it was a self-depicting um, journal in which the defendant kills her demons with a box cutter knife. Knowing that shortly after, she intentionally killed Alex by stabbing him 16 times with a knife is terrifying. Also in her letter about Ted Bundy, she writes about the lack of guilt and the ability to distract others with grandiose self-presentation, making it hard to assess a self-report of a psychopath. The, psychopaths are skilled at faking emotional expressions, that they are emotionally intelligent individuals despite the fact they are largely devo devoid of emotion, that they will use manipulation and the disregard for the right of others. It's important to see them as classic predators. We heard this morning from the family the, the lack of guilt and remorse that they observed during the trial, as well as her actions after she killed Alex, which show the lack of remorse. Not only should the court consider her writings about Ted Bundy, her self-reflecting journal, the defendant is showing a complete and utter lack of remorse for what she has done and the loss of Alex's life. Her true feelings for Alex and the hate she had for him was depicted in her journal, too, that was edited the night before Alex's murder, where she describes I never had their name a name in my contacts. I would look at them and not see beauty, but a red nose too big for a face where eyes look dead, a brow jutting out of a large bulbous forehead, a smile that make me cringe, pores and veins stuck out on pasty translucent skin, all felt like buds, bugs under my skin. This is a woman who has blamed everyone else for her actions. This is a defendant whose complete disregard for her actions are also well documented in her jail correspondence, which I have a few I would like to file with the court. Judge, I'm going to object because the state did not tell us that they were going to do this in advance of the sentencing. Um, and 
give us an opportunity to review these with Ezra McCandless. They gave us thousands of pages of writings by Ezra McCandless, and they wrote in their sentencing memo that she had talked about wanting to get a tattoo if she was acquitted. But, it, you know, I haven't had a chance to review these, to ask what they mean. I, we're going to take a long break in the middle so I can go back in the jail and review this with Ezra McCandless. Um, I, I, I'm somewhat shocked by the way the state has approached the sentencing presentation. So I guess I'm going to ask for a recess to uh, do this. I don't know if these are relevant to sentencing or not because I don't know what the state has chosen to show. I did send the state an email several weeks ago asking um, to receive all victim witness impact statements and other matters that they wished to use for the court at sentencing in advance so I could review them with Ms. McCandless and not, uh, with, with Ezra McCandless and not um, disrupt the court at all during the presentation, state did not respond to my email. I sent it to all three prosecutors. Um, yesterday, the state advised that they had only received four, that there were only going to be four people that addressed the court. Obviously, there are pre-typed letters that states had in its possession for quite a while, which is fine. And I, I feel for everybody who got up here and talked about the loss of Alex, and they certainly have a right to speak, but um, what the state is engaging in now is not appropriate. So I guess I want to ask for a recess. Your Honor, these were provided in discovery. There is no obligation for the state to let the defense know what exhibits or what's, what we're going to be arguing during a sentencing. It's what is relevant. And these were provided a long time ago, years ago, a year ago. I mean, so um, there's certainly no reason for a recess. The state should be allowed to continue with this argument. Well, and what would be the what would be the point of uh, going over it with Ms. McCandless? I mean, it, really, the question is, you know, did she author these letters or did she not? I mean, they have DOJ numbers that appear to have been part of a discovery that's provided to the defense. You want to take a few minutes here, and I guess if you have an issue as to whether she actually wrote them, but I, I'm not going to uh, not going to have a recess right now. Uh, we'll probably have a recess before uh, the uh, defense presentation, but. Um, I should go ahead and look through them. And uh, again, the rules of evidence do not apply at sentencing. If these are the letters of Ms. McCandless, uh, I think it's fair game uh, for the state. So, Judge, I just would like to call attention to the lack of professional courtesy that has existed here. Well, I think and you've already done that. So, uh, On DOJ, page number 3916, the defendant writes to her friend Sailor, Hold on, just I'm going to give the defense just a moment. Take a look at them if there's a question as to whether. I'm, I'm sorry, what page number? Ms. McCandless had authored these. It's the first page. I'm going page by page. <laughs> okay, go ahead for this page. I'll, I'll read along one at a time. All right. Starting at the top, court date, I'm pretty sure will be the last one that I'll be in this lovely orange. I'm more than happy about this. Middle of the page, I also really want to whiten my teeth. Also when I come home, lots of dark coffee. It will be mocha time when I come home, all day you. I do know what tattoo I really like. I have lots of ideas what will be done. I'm an art book that prints and can walk around. I have a goal that I will work on a tattoo degree. Next page, 3187. I wish I was home to smile at all of the love and support for you and my family. I really am so lucky to be blessed with the family I have. Most kids are just born into it. I was picked. So this must mean I'm just that much more special, right? I really do I do wish that my summer was spent at home. I really hate to miss that garage sale season. Let's shoot for next year. I will be at your side seeing things with you. I keep busy most of the time and try to keep my head up and Just mind sharp. Just think of it as my life is on pause. One thing that does change is my hair. It is so long and will only get longer. You can get haircuts in here. But I promised Jason I would not cut it. 
I really like the idea of long locks anyways. All my love, Ezra McCandless. DOJ, page 3395. Dad, I love you and pray for you. Something wish you the best in this life. In the middle of the page, I am always your little girl and love you and the things you've taught me. I value all the things I've learned over the years. I keep your words close to my heart. DOJ 3869. I will keep my head up and keep on, keep up on making goals. This is scary stuff at times, but I think I can do this. I know I can. I just can't wait until I go back into the real world and start my life up. I miss you and love you all so much. My life is not the same without my family. All my love as McCandless. DOJ 3777. I'm mega super excited to do my hair in ombre this spring. Also, as a makeup artist, it's so strange for me to be very plain Jane. On the quote out, I have red lipstick on every day. So like this pic, I'm so going to rock this look in April. Whoop, can't wait. God, I might be a dork. DOJ 3671 uh, addressed to Devon, it appears that there was in jail correspondence, numerous individuals in the jail who wrote Ms. Canlis and um, she wrote back to them. Well, hello, Devon, in the middle of 3671. A single cigarette could summon the strength of character to put a good face on this fucked up situation. My bike might, must miss me so much. Also, I have so much ink to put on my body. What's your spirit animal? Mine is the fox. And then there's a picture of my sass face. DOJ 3180, a letter to Jason. Uh, near the end of the letter, what you will find in this envelope is my self picture as a quote, foxy little wife. Do you see what is around my neck? I really do miss you, love you all the same. I can't wait to get your letter sometime soon. Sorry if I'm strange and talk at you so much. Just know you still hold your spot in my chest. And then the next page, I can't sleep. No, really, Jason. So I'll make a list. The stuff that will happen when Ez comes home list. Number one, nose, nips, Left top of ear, all done. Number two, get my hair color done by a pro, not a cut. Will look so good done right, not by me. Number three, get my nails done. Number four, get my ink done on my arm. Also a word on my chest below my collarbone in small print. Number five, bike stuff, ride all over town. Number six, coffee shop stuff, drink a mocha. Number seven, photo shoot. Number eight, kiss, hug, hold my, I think it might be Ellie. I love that kiddo. Nine, swim, and 10, open and close a real door. Each and every one of these references were about me or I. Not once was there any sorrow or remorse for the loss of Alex's life. Additionally, several of these letters demonstrate the defendant's continued manipulation of the truth for her own self-benefit. As despite the defendant's sentencing memorandum, her letters clearly demonstrate a love and healthy relationship with her father. Despite the fact that she's alleging that her lack of emotion is a result of her father's abuse. The defendant's actions throughout the trial demonstrate her complete lack of human decency and empathy. While Alex's family was forced to relive his violent death and see photographs of his lifeless, bloody body, the defendant was basking in the glow of all the attention she was receiving. And finally, when the court considers the defendant's character, plain and simple, this defendant is a liar. The jury saw through her, her lies and explicitly in their verdict did not believe a word she said. They found beyond a reasonable doubt 
that she lied, and if they believed any part of her version of what happened, they wouldn't have found her guilty of first-degree intentional homicide. She tried to conceal Alex's body. She tried to conceal his phone. She tried to conceal the murder weapon. She tried to conceal the truth. And in each one of these attempts, she failed. The third factor for the court to consider is the rehabilitation of the defendant. You need to ask yourself, how can any system or, pro or programming fix a cold-blooded killer? But not only is she a cold-blooded killer, she refuses to acknowledge her guilt in this matter. How do you rehabilitate someone who doesn't think they did anything wrong and doesn't show any remorse? The defendant alleges she has been trained not to cry. But as the evidence has shown, she cries when it's beneficial to her, when she cried at Don Sipple's house. The defense spends substantial amounts of time in their memorandum discussing brain development and cites two juvenile cases on brain development, not adult cases. But left entirely out of this analysis is that the defendant is convicted of knowingly and intentionally murdering Alexander Woodworth. She planned the crime. She brought the knife. She picked the location. She committed the crime. She attempted to stage a, a crime scene. She attempted to conceal the body, conceal the knife, conceal his phone. These actions alone demonstrate the defendant's complete, rational, systematic thought process. This wasn't like a reactive juvenile act. This was a detailed plan that she continued for days after the murder, throughout the trial, and to this day. At the end of the day, the seriousness of the offense, the need to protect the public, far outweigh her rehabilitative needs. The fourth factor for the court to consider is the protection of the public. And lengthy incarceration in this case is necessary to send a direct message to both the defendant and the members of this community that there is a zero tolerance for this behavior. That if you intentionally take the life of another, you will lose your freedom for the rest of your life. This was an utterly senseless homicide, which makes this case so disturbing. How does another human being do this to another person? Stab them 16 times and leave them in the middle of nowhere, in the cold, to try to cover up what they did. There's such a lack of human decency, such a lack of remorse. And without remorse and accountability, there's no hope for rehabilitation. The violent nature of this crime, combined with the defendant luring the victim to his death, the cover-up, the lies, demonstrate that she's a direct and substantial threat to any member of this public, and that the community in, in Dunn County at large need to be protected from Ezra McCandless. Now, I understand that our justice system is moving towards uniformity, but a computer chart system containing the defendant's risk levels based on her own self-serving statements cannot be the way we determine how severe a crime is and when a person should be eligible for parole. There are some cases that you can't look at a risk level and a compass assessment to tell you how much time a person should spend in prison. And given the facts in this case, this is one of those cases. This jury sent a message when it delivered its verdict that our justice system is not broken that you can't lie your way out of your actions. That a community needs to be protected from the defendant and needs to know that there are consequences for your actions. And in this case, the consequence must be life without parole. The pre-sentence investigation report is recommending 50 years uh, eligibility for parole. And although the state understands the reasoning utilized by the writer, it does not agree that a 50-year prison sentence is sufficient in this instance due to the extremely brutal nature of the crime and the need to protect the public. This is one of those cases where our justice system caught the defendant before she did this to more than one person. We cannot allow her to do this to another family. 
The defense has also argued in its memorandum that the family has forgiven the defendant, and that should play a factor in your honor's sentencing today. And while I've gotten to know the Wardworth family, and they are certainly very religious and forgiving people, Joan Woodworth's victim impact statements, the grandma, provides that while she must forgive the defendant, she feels, and I quote, if I feel if given the opportunity, she will definitely kill again. And my prayer is that she will never be able to harm another person like she did Alex or put another family through what we have been through. Her husband Marv ends his victim impact statement with, there are not enough years left, any place to replace or to pay the price of Alex's death. But despite the fact this family is working towards forgiveness, being forgiven doesn't excuse your actions. True forgiveness requires the defendant acknowledge what she has done and accept responsibility, and she has certainly not done that. In essence, the defendant believes she's entitled to a life of her own outside of confinement, despite her actions in this case. Allowing such an action would be wholly contrary to the term justice in its truest form, as her deliberate and intentional acts have deprived Alex of that same opportunity. The defendant took something away from this family that they could never get back. And not only did she take away Alex, she took away their ability for closure, for grandkids to find peace, because she refuses still to accept responsibility. So when I was going through Alex's Facebook account for the trial, I noticed a number of Facebook messages that were after Alex's death. And so I spoke to Alex's sister, Sarah, and she gave, gave me permission to share some of these entries with the court. I think they're relevant to show just the seriousness of the offense. Uh, these are from pages 105 and 106 in DOJ, you, 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 you. On May 3rd of 2018, Sarah Woodworth writes to Alex, despite being deceased, I love you. I love you so fucking much. I thought I'd have a lifetime to tell you, but now you're gone and it's not fair. I miss you, It should have been me. And a small part is hoping you'll see this, but I know you're dead and you never will. Oh God, Alex, I just wish you knew you'd know it all, how you were my inspiration. You got me to look harder, try more, and embrace life. I love you. I love you, I miss you. Two months later, four months after his death on July 20th, she writes to Alex again, hey, I'm going back to college soon. I wish you were here to see it. I keep thinking you're just away, somewhere without phones, but you'll be back. Anywho, I'm gonna be a marine biologist. I know, not a great job, right? But I think I can fight hard enough for it. Hey, if you ever see this, wherever you are, can you give me some advice? Don't know if I should invest in a big university or nah, I love you, I miss you. On October 31st, 2018, well, I don't believe in an afterlife anymore. So like, I know there's no way you're reading this, that this is all vain. I'm shouting into a place that is empty, a void that'll never answer. So I have to say goodbye now. I have to, because I haven't, and I have to. I love you. I wish there was a God and you were alive in some sense out there, but you're gone forever. I wish I had, we had been closer at the end. I wish it had been me. Goodbye, Alex. These messages weren't meant for the court. They weren't meant for the prosecution. They weren't meant for the defense. Sarah never got the chance to say goodbye to her brother as a result of the heinous, brutal actions of the defendant. And the, these messages only show a fraction of the pain her actions have caused and continue to cause. The defense attempts to argue that she will not have a life until she is paroled. But unlike Alex, she will have a life. 
It'll just be different from the one she knows. The defendant still gets to talk, write to her loved ones. Her family can still go visit her in prison, send her gifts. But the only thing Alec's family gets to visit is his grave. In this case, we are dealing with a motive that is so irrational, which makes this case so disturbing. Not only the brutal nature, this leaving someone there to die and the attempted cover-up, but there's just no reason the defendant needed to murder Alex that day. And on top of that, her not willing to accept what she did makes her even more dangerous, that the public needs to be protected from the defendant for the maximum amount possible. The integrity of our justice system, the seriousness of the offense, and the need to protect the public require that this defendant actually serve a life sentence. The state requests that the defendant be sentenced to life without the eligibility for parole. The state is further requesting no contact with the victims, immediate or extended family, no possession of firearms or weapons, a DNA sample, Restitution in the amount of $6,944.51 with an order that uh, restitution be taken out of the <coughs> defendant's prison wages and she has 683 days credit for time already served. And we'd also ask that any um, money that's deposited into her accounts also be applied towards restitution. All right, in the, the state submitted a restitution order, is that correct? Yes. Is that the extent? I know in your uh, sentencing memorandum you're asking for what sixty days after sentencing, but that is that's the that is the request. I believe so. Yes, Judge, okay. we're going to stipulate to the restitution, so there's no issue there. I think that the legal standard is fifty per fifty percent of an uh, a prisoner's um, prison funds are to pay restitution. That's the legal standard, and I'd ask the court to apply the correct legal standard. All right. And I'll just note it's, it's not a parole it's not a parole case it's uh, that's prior to 1999 it's a extended supervision case um, so what I assume the state is asking is life without the possibility of petitioning for extended supervision yes your honor okay um, all right and as a, that concludes the state's presentation